Hi, this is Dr. Diane Gayhart, and this is my lecture on Cognitive Behavioral Approaches to Counseling and Psychotherapy, uh, based on my textbook, Theory and Treatment Planning in Counseling and Psychotherapy. And in this lecture, I'm going to give you an overview of the cognitive and behavioral approaches, including an introduction to mindfulness. Behavioral, cognitive, and cognitive behavioral approaches are a group of related counseling methods that emphasize and use a very active techniques, there's a lot of psychoeducation, and really focus on concrete changes, measurable changes in behavior cognition in affect. And you will hear them spoken about quite often. They have one of the most robust evidence bases in the entire field. They're, they have been researched because for many, many years, and it's really part of the culture in many ways of the cognitive behavioral tradition. And you will see that um, culture of kind of rigorous thinking and evaluating from an objective stance whether or not the approach is working, whether or not one's uh, beliefs are working. So in many ways that research culture that's strongly associated with the cognitive behavioral tradition is actually even reflected in the actual methods themselves. So when you're out in the field um, you will hear a lot of buzz about cognitive behavioral because many third-party payers favor cognitive behavioral because of their evidence base and for that reason um, they're just increasingly popular. So, um, uh, And there are many approaches and a long history associated with cognitive behavioral so uh, buckle your seat belts, uh, we, we got an adventure ahead of us. So there are three streams of practice uh, being pure behavioral, pure cognitive, and more of a hybrid cognitive behavioral approach. And unfortunately though, um, that even each one of these streams, they, they more or less have different histories more than today if you talk to someone uh, in contemporary practices, it's very hard to separate these out. And for that reason I've put them into one chapter because most people in the 21st century, when they draw from one of these, they draw from all of these. And so in many ways, the, the average cognitive behavioral uh, practitioner, most all of them are doing an integration of cognitive and behavioral. But there are many strands of um, practice and thought, and I'm going to give you a tour of uh, some of the, the many highlights in these approaches. So when we look at the history of what many would call behavioral therapy, um, the first wave of behaviorism, I think everyone really agrees uh, that this is clearly pure behaviorism, um, and it was based on classical conditioning and operant conditioning and also social learning theory. So these are kind of based on the original theories of behaviorism, and these were translated into therapeutic methods. And so you're probably familiar with um, Pavlov's dogs or Skinner's cats, and we're going to go over that later in this lecture, but that comes from really the first wave of behaviorism. In the second wave of behaviorism, there's more of an integration of cognitive approaches with the behaviorism. And so before the 1980s, these were more separate streams of research and practice, but since the 1980s, they've really been more integrated. And, and of course there's also an integration coming from the other side where cognitive practitioners have integrated more behaviorism. So it's kind of, uh, you, get, you get the history of behavioral, you know, comma, cognitive behavioral in, from different angles. Um, but in contemporary practice, most practitioners end up in some kind of hybrid version. The third wave of behaviorism, and many to separate this from just your average cognitive behavioral approach. So yes, this history gets quite complex and depending who you speak with, you get a different history. But the third wave is sometimes referred to as the integration of mindfulness-based approaches. And what's really interesting about this is that the mindfulness approach, rather than contradicting or correcting illogical or you know dysfunctional thoughts or behaviors, the um, a practice is really to use acceptance in order to transform them, and we'll go into more detail about that. But it's a very different, because in many ways, uh, traditional both cogn both traditional cognitive and traditional behavioral approaches very much had this: let's identify the dysfunctional behavior or thought, and in one way or another, correct it. Where this uh, much more contemporary 21st century approach, there's an increasing 
uh, utilization of this idea of accepting and not fighting with and having compassion for problematic thoughts and feelings which seems to thereby transform them in one way or another. So we'll get into some detail about that too later in this lecture. So that's kind of the history of the behavioral approaches. Now most people will associate uh, a pure cognitive approach with uh, Aaron Beck and he developed his ideas independently from behavioral approaches. And so this approach focuses primarily on um, a person's thinking processes. And it looks at how psychological disorders are characterized by these dysfunctional thinking, which are based on more underlying dysfunctional beliefs, and we're going to get into a lot of detail about that. And that, you know, counseling helps people by modifying these dysfunctional thoughts and beliefs and allowing them to, you know, choose different behaviors. And so cognitive therapy um, can be used separately from behaviorism or as part of an integrated cognitive behavioral practice. And it can also be used, and some see it as a meta-theory, for a general integrative practice. And so next we have the cognitive be behavioral approaches, which these are approaches which from the beginning really integrated both behavioral and cognitive theories and techniques, um, and they really focus on changing thoughts, behaviors, and or feelings. And so there are many that have developed over the years. Uh, these include multimodal therapy, rational and motive behavioral therapy, reality therapy, and some of the mindfulness-based approaches that we'll be talking about later. When I was trying to identify the juice, the significant contribution to the field, um, it's quite challenging because the field of cognitive behavioral therapy is really so vast. But when it, what it came down to, I, I think, is their most uh, greatest insight and most useful concept is the idea that our thoughts about a situation, not the situation itself, are really the source of our emotional, our emotional and behavioral problems. And so one of the ways that this has been best uh, summarized or illustrated is Albert Ellis's ABC theory. But again, it all boils down to, in the, especially in the cognitive approaches, this, this idea that, you know, life happens to us, someone says something nasty, uh, we don't get what we want out of life, whatever it may be, and it feels like that that event makes us unhappy. And that's really when you're sitting in a human body and a human consciousness, it's, it just seems like the world out there is coming toward you and that's what's making you unhappy for one reason or another. And the way our brains just seem to operate is we don't see how our own filters, our beliefs, the way we look at it, the way we construct that reality to slip into some postmodern language to foreshadow uh, upcoming chapters, um, that that's actually the source of the problem and that is how we can change our behaviors, our moods, and our reactions and ultimately find more effective ways to respond. So Ellis sums up this um, basic cognitive premise in his ABC model and this often is a very concrete way for people to kind of get the idea. So A is the activating event, it's the trigger event or a person. And C is the emotional or behavioral, quote-unquote, consequence. That's the C. Um, and so as life comes at us, it feels always like, I think it's very natural for a person to feel like A causes C. And the insight that uh, cognitive behavioralists and um, CBT people offer us is that really it's B, the belief about A, that is the true source of the cause of emotional and behavioral consequences and distress in our symptoms. And so, you know, in a nutshell, in many ways, a cognitive and cognitive behavioral therapist's main goal is to help clients realize how that their beliefs about the stressful situations in their life is actually what's causing the problem, not the problem. And perhaps the most famous um, example to prove this point is is actually the work of existentialist Viktor Frankl who described life in, concentra in Nazi concentration camps and how 
even though that is probably one of the most horrific human experiences one can imagine, that even with that very painful activating event, it was really the inmates' beliefs about it that resulted in their emotional and behavioral experiences, whether it was total despair, or whether they were still able to find hope and meaning. And so when you look at an example like that, it uh, makes it much easier to step back and look at how someone's snide comment or not getting the job you want, um, how that activating event, it is our beliefs that create our negative responses and our difficult emotions and to take responsibility for examining our beliefs and how they affect our moods and behaviors. Although there are many forms of cognitive behavioral therapies, the general process across all of these is remarkably similar. So in the first step, there's a real emphasis on a systematic assessment. And so each approach has a slightly different you know, way of doing this. But basically, there's some form of uh, obtaining a detailed description of behavioral and or cognitive um, functioning, often called a baseline of functioning, and we'll get into a little more detail of that. But really looking at the frequency, duration, and context of the behaviors, defining problems like, you know, I'm depressed, you know, that needs a lot more definition. What does that look like? You know, what is the frequency and duration of those symptoms? Does it happen, you know, mostly during the day when you go to work? Are you okay? Is it worse at night? Those sorts of things. You know, does it make you feel sad? Are you still doing, you know, activities you enjoy? So even when someone can report a depressed mood, a cognitive behavioralist still hasn't, needs a lot more information to really get a thorough assessment. And we'll go into a lot of detail about that. Then in step two, um, there's a real focus on targeting the behaviors and or thoughts for change. And so identifying very specific, very specific behaviors and thoughts rather than generally you know, improving mood. And so their goals are very carefully constructed to be behavioral and measurable. Then generally in step three, the next phase, there's some form of educating clients about their irrational thoughts or dysfunctional behavioral patterns and helping motivate them to change. And then in the final phase, there is some place of replacing these um, dysfunctional thoughts and behaviors with more productive ones, taking real action, um, and kind of often, it's often thought of as almost retraining the person in how to handle a particular situation or look at things in a different way. Uh, the counselor takes on a primary role of being an educator and an expert. The counselor takes responsibility for the process, uh, approaching the situation as though they are an expert who knows, you know, who can assess and who has a good sense of what to do about it. Nonetheless, empathy is used often more in the process of creating rapport, um, which allows them to use more real interventions um, that are going to change the, the behaviors, thoughts, and emotions. Empathy is generally not considered in a CPT approach as the curative element, which, um, as you may remember in the humanistic approaches, they have a different approach and a different way of using empathy. So it's important to make these distinctions and understand that even though empathy is used in CBT approaches, it's, it's used in a very different way. Often another interesting technique that uh, CBT people use is um, using written contracts. So spelling out goals and expectations to help structure the relationship and increase motivation. Or sometimes they even have clients assign these uh, written contracts as a way to help motivate and clarify and make sure everyone's on the exact same page about why we're here and what we're going to do. The daughter of Aaron Beck um, describes some contemporary cognitive behavioral alliance elements and she emphasizes that in contemporary practice that CBT therapists and counselors cl actively collaborate much more with the um, client, making decisions um, about the process, uh, making these decisions jointly and with client input. Also demonstrating more empathy and caring and understanding than it may have been characterized in earlier forms of CBT. Also adapting one's uh, counseling approach and style, whether it's the interventions, how much self-disclosure, how much directness, 
Just adjusting it based on the client's personality, presenting problem, diversity issues, those sorts of things. So there is a much more uh, variety in terms of adjusting how one engages with clients. And also there's an emphasis and a belief that by being effective, by alleviating the client's distress and demonstrating clinical effect effectiveness, that this actually enhances the counseling relationship. So from a CBT perspective, they are very much results oriented, which is perhaps why insurance companies like them so much. And so there's also this belief by being effective, you're going to, you know, clients are going to trust you more and trust the process more. And also another thing that they use is the process of eliciting feedback at the end of the session. You know, how did the session go? Did we talk about the right things? Does it feel like this is going to work? And that way also counselors can intervene early in cases of rupture to the counseling alliance. Case conceptualization. This is where we begin to see some of the distinctions between the different schools of cognitive behavioral uh, counseling. But I would add that many of these uh, ways of con conceptualizing are very complementary. So I think maybe compared to some other approaches like psychodynamic, when it comes to uh, cognitive behavioral, I think it's very easy to actually borrow across most of, the, most of the approaches in terms of how they conceptualize. For example, baseline functioning is primarily used um, in behavioral approaches or emphasized in those approaches, but it's quite easy to integrate with other approaches and baseline functioning basically um, involves having clients uh, go home and often over a course of a week or so identify the frequency, the duration, and the severity of specific behavioral symptoms you know related to depression, anxiety, panic, anger, conflict, those sorts of things. And so oftentimes we humans, our, our recall um, is so influenced by our stories about things, our ideas, our beliefs, so to speak, that actually getting a, a real baseline functioning can be quite enlightening both for clients and the counselor because oftentimes we um, overestimate the severity and or frequency or sometimes we underestimate the severity or frequency. And so having a, a written behavioral baseline um, of functioning can be very, very helpful. And sometimes, you know, depending on the situation, you could add antecedent events, things that may have triggered it or things that happened afterwards. So there are many variations depending on the client and situation, um, how you might do this and organize this. To this is the idea of functional analysis which is looking, again, it's another record that clients can do between sessions where they document when they had their symptoms, how long it lasted, how severe it was, what were the events before, what were the events after. And so these uh, functional analysis records can be used to, again, help the counselor assess the situation and figure out how best to intervene. And these are very practical um, for a wide range of clinical issues that clients bring the session. Now functional analysis goes a little bit deeper than the baseline assessment and that oftentimes the purpose is to discover what is the function of the system um, either for the individual and or for the couple or family system. Functional analysis is definitely used quite a bit when working with couples or family because there's the assumption that the symptom um, has plays some function in maintaining family homeostasis. And so that that's, comes out of a systemic uh, view of problems. And so even from a CBT approach, the functional analysis is real critical in that. So the question is, you know, some of the questions that counselors used during functional analysis are, you know, what were you doing before, sometimes during and after the episode? Where were you? Who was around? What's the time of day? Were you, what were you thinking about beforehand? Describe your inner conversation or thought, you know, what's going on in your head? Um, what's going on in your life at that, at that time in general or during, during or after the event? Uh, what were the normal activities? What were atypical stressors? And so, so the counselor goes about, you know, examining the various, you know, antecedents and consequences and trying to get a sense of what the unusual stressors or possible triggers are as part of the assessment of the function of the symptom for the individual or for the couple or family.
uh, case conceptualization approach is looking for core beliefs and schemas. And this comes out of the work of uh, Aaron Beck. And so he identifies several layers of problematic thoughts and beliefs. And the first are just automatic thoughts. And these are the knee-jerk reactions to distressing situations that a person can generally identify. Like if someone says something rude to you, you know, your automatic thought is either, hey, I shouldn't be treated like that, or, you know, my feelings were hurt, or whatever your automatic thought process is. Then there are the intermediate beliefs, so extreme or absolute rules that are more general that shape the automatic thoughts, such as um, no one should ever, you know, speak to someone like that. And so because of that, that's rude, it's unacceptable. So those intermediate beliefs, a person can normally scratch a little bit below the surface and, and come up with those, but these are more rigid just beliefs about how uh, life should be, how people should be, how things should go. So core beliefs are more global and absolute about ourselves, about the person. And so there tend to be two uh, general principles or themes that underlie most core beliefs. One is, uh, is autonomy, um, beliefs about being effective and productive versus helpless. And the other are more sociotropic, meaning beliefs that are about being lovable or unlovable. Am I good enough, lovable enough, um, and am I able to do something about this situation, or am I helpless in this situation? So these are some of the core beliefs. And then uh, underneath that are the, the schemas. And these are the, you know, the, the deepest level, so to speak. But these are more cognitive frameworks um, that organize and shape thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. These are developed generally early in childhood and informed by numerous other factors, including family and culture, gender, religion, occupation, social economic class. And so these schemas may also not be readily evident um, until they're triggered by a specific event. My favorite specific event that seems to trigger a lot of these schemas is marriage. Because many couples have very different ideas about gender and their role in a relationship. And when they get married, it's like, I don't know, almost out from, from the basement. Something seeps up um, and people start enacting and judging their partners often on these very basic schemas about... Um, what should be going on in the relationship and what each person's role is in the relationship. And so th that would be a form of schema. Doesn't re return my call in 24 hours, you know, she really doesn't like me. And the intermediate belief there is that good friends always return calls quickly. And the core belief beneath that is, you know, I am fundamentally worthless. And so the schema there is I'm worthless even if my, best, if my best friend won't take time to call me. No one really cares about me. So what's the point of trying to have friends? So you can see where that might go. So that's an example of how uh, core thoughts and schemas can work. So another way that cognitive uh, approaches look at um, problematic cognitions is trying to identify specific patterns and how cognitions get distorted. So they have a, many different uh, ways to categorize these, and I'm just going to run through some of the um, some of the favorites. So first is arbitrary influence, um, which is a belief that's based on very little evidence. So this could be assuming your partner is cheating on you because they don't answer the phone right away. Another one related to that is selective abstraction. So that's focusing on one detail while ignoring the context and obvious others. So my favorite is, um, you know, a, a supervisor does an evaluation and or, you know, your instructor grades a paper and there's one or two things that, you know, you get noted that are not perfect. And so it's very common that people just focus all on that and just ignore the fact that 95% of the rest of it was great. Overgeneralization. Um, similarly, it's generalizing one or two incidents that make a broad sweeping judgment. Um, so again, parents often do this about their kids because they dye their hair, you know, that means that they're just down the road to, um, you know, total destruction, self-destruction. 
So overgeneralizations are also quite common. And it should be noted that most of us do variations of all of these and different aspects in our lives just to, just to keep cognitive therapists employed. So another common patterns are magnification and or minimization. So going to the extreme of either overemphasizing or underemphasizing based on the facts. So, um, so this is common uh, here with the example of being, you know, ignoring that your child has two semesters of poor grades. So ignoring two semesters of poor grades is an example of minimizing. Hiring a tutor for one low test score is magnification. And so these are ways, and there's so many facets in our lives where we can do magnification or minimization uh, depending on the issue. Um, personalization is a very particular form of arbitrary influence that is um, especially common in intimate relationships where external events are attributed to oneself. So, so that is when oftentimes we feel like because your spouse, you know, is not paying full attention to you when you come home from work, um, that they are upset with you or that you've done something or that you take it personally in some way where they're just stressed from a, a difficult commute or a difficult day at work. And so personalization is a very, very common pattern uh, that many of us use in many of our um, various uh, spheres of life, work, relationships, etc. The list does go on, and it goes on and on, but we will be ending soon here. In terms of distorted cognitions, there's also dichotomous thinking, that's all or none, always never, good or bad, um, this sort of thing. Mislabeling is assigning personality traits as someone based on a handful of incidents rather than, you know, ignoring uh, ex exceptions and such. And oftentimes we mislabel, especially others that we don't know very well. My favorite example is when a person makes a poor driving decision in front of you on the freeway, you almost automatically label them as a bad driver. But often if we were to make the exact same move, we would realize that we were having a, a bad day, and there's some reason for that. So it's a fundamental attribution error for those of you who have a psych undergrad background. Otherwise, you can Google that. But that's a very common type of thing. It's, it's, and the fundamental attribution error is, is one version of mislabeling. Mind reading is another fun one. Um, but that's believing that you know what the other is thinking or what they will do without really any supporting evidence. And this, this often becomes a very significant barrier to good communication. Um, in relationships of, of various kinds. Cognitive therapists have also gone about identifying dysfunctional schemas that are typically associated with specific personality disorders. So as a dependent personality disorder, the basic belief is I'm helpless. And avoidant personalities is this underlying schema of I might get hurt. Passive aggressive is I might get stepped on. The paranoid uh, schema is people are out to get me. Every once in a while they are, but normally they're not. Uh, narcissistic people believe that they are special. Uh, the histrionic, uh, there's an underlying need to impress people to be good enough. Compulsive uh, personalities uh, have the underlying fear that errors are, are bad and that there is no recovery from them, basically. The, anti the antisocial person look that, uh, that people are there to be taken, and the schizoid is personality. The fundamental schema there is that I need plenty of space to be okay. So these are um, some typical schemas that are associated to personality disorders. A person may not have a disorder, the particular actually full-blown diagnostic disorder because they have these underlying schemas. Um, but this can be useful uh, when working with certain clients. Albert Ellis um, worked with the concept of irrational beliefs, and he I identified three basic musts, the shoulds, the oughts, and the musts in our life. Uh, the f first is are based around uh, perfection-based worth. So this idea that I must be thoroughly competent, adequate, achieving, and lovable at all times, or else I am an incompetent, worthless person. And so these typically are associated with more with feelings of anxiety, panic, depression, despair, or worthlessness. Um, another common uh, irrational belief is 
are formed around the concept of justice for me. So this is more the idea that other significant people in my life must treat me kindly and fairly at all times, or else I can't stand it. They are bad, rotten, evil persons who should be severely blamed, damned, and vindictively punished for their horrible treatment of me. You may know a few people like that. Um, but these are people who typically experience lots of feelings of anger, rage, fury, vindictiveness, um, and they uh, tend to be in conflict quite a bit. And the third um, element here is the effortless perfection, the beliefs around effortless perfection. And these are people who generally have the belief that things and conditions must absolutely be the way I want them, and it must never be too difficult or frustra frustrating. Otherwise, life is terrible, awful, horrible, catastrophic, and unbearable. So, as you might imagine, uh, such a belief leads to low frustration tolerance, a lot of self-pity, anger, depression, often procrastination, avoidance, or inaction. So, and again, these are uh, three of the common patterns that Alice observed. So Aaron Beck did a lot of work with depression, and he identified uh, three sets of negative thoughts that tends to characterize most people who have depressed thinking. And the first are negative thoughts about the self. I'm worthless. I'm not good enough. And the next is negative thoughts about the world and environment, that life is unfair, nothing ever goes my way. And, and then finally, there are negative thoughts about the future. So things are never going to get better. I'm never going to get what I'm hoping for out of life. So when you have this combination of three, three sets of negative beliefs, as you might imagine, that is a recipe for depression. And so uh, Beck would, of course, try to identify these three sets of belief in people who experience depression and try to address all three kind of arenas or types of thoughts to help uh, people move through and address depression. So in multimodal therapy, um, it is designed to be a very brief and solution-oriented and yet very comprehensive approach. And the assessment is, this process is called the basic id, and it takes uh, you through an assessment of seven different elements and so it gives a very integrative, comprehensive um, approach to assessment. And the basic id stands for behavior, affect, sensation, imagery, cognition, interpersonal relationships, and drugs biology. And so I'm going to take you on a little brief tour here of what the basic id assessment might look like for general mental health issues. So first you're looking at behaviors. So what behaviors are getting in the way of the person's happiness. What do they want to stop or start doing or do, you know, so looking at both what behaviors we need to have less of and behaviors we need to have more of. So in terms of affect, you're, you're uh, assessing a person's moods and emotions. So what makes you laugh and cry? What makes you mad, sad, glad, and scared? Are you troubled by particular emotions that you feel over, over and over again? Sensations. So these are looking at a person's experiences of physical senses, you know, sight, touch, feel. So looking at what, um, you know, what things a person likes to hear, taste, touch, or smell. Um, do you experience a lot of unpleasant sensations, including pain or dizziness, physical things? Um, so also uh, addressing some of the sensual um, turn-ons and turn-offs for a person. So moving on, you have imagery, which is an interesting one, and this could take many, many different forms, including what do you picture yourself doing in the immediate future? How do you, how would you describe your self-image, your body image? And what do you like about these images? How do they influence your life? So, there, and if there's any particular imagery that has particular meaning to a client, uh, that would also be applicable here. Next, uh, they look at cognition. So what are your most cherished beliefs and values? What are the main shoulds and oughts and musts that uh, drive your life? Do you have intellectual interests or pursuits? Uh, how do your thoughts affect your emotions? So ex exploring how the whole thought process works. The last element is looking at interpersonal relationships and drugs and biology. So in terms of relationships, who are the important people? What do you expect of them? How do they affect you? How do you affect them? So, But getting a sense, do they have close, intimate, personal relationships that are going well? And then finally, looking at drugs and biology. So do you have medical concerns? 
What are your diet and exercise habits? What type of medications do you use? Do you drink, smoke, use recreational drugs? How much, how often? So just getting a good assessment of the basic biology of the situation. When setting goals in cognitive behavioral therapy, um, this is a real central part actually of the process and it's often discussed very concretely and specifically and in detail with clients more so than many other approaches. And the focus is really on symptom and problem reduction and resolution. And so it's very, the goals are all very directly related to the identified symptoms and or problems. And more from a broader perspective, you can think of it as um, helping clients to become more independent problem solvers in their own lives, which makes sense. And more specifically, the goals in um, cognitive behavioral focus are, are, should always be behavioral and measurable. And so these goals should be very, very concrete so that anyone who's in on the conversation would be able to clearly identify um, when, you know, when the goal has been met. So something like reducing arguments to more than more than no more than once per month. And so and they can even write down these goals and this will be the measure as when therapy is ready to end. Some examples of goals um, in cognitive behavioral. In the middle phase, for example, you would be reducing or ending episodes of cutting or self-harm. You could be reducing perfectionistic beliefs about work performance or relationships or whatever it might be. You could be reducing generalizations or mind reading with partner. Towards the late phase, again, this will be more um, inc maybe increasing some positive things. Um, such as increasing the engagement in enjoyable activities, hobbies, and relationships. And so here you can see that this is a much more behavioral than saying increase positive mood, because positive mood is pretty vague, but for a lot of people, positive mood you know, would be characterized by engaging in enjoyable activities, hobbies, and relationships. So increasing positive mood isn't a terrible goal, but it's not the most behavioral or measurable. And so whenever possible you try to use much more concrete uh, ease, I mean, easily identifiable to an outside observer where positive mood is a very subjective experience. Uh, you could have end use of sub substances to manage difficult moods, manage moods and or using you know managing moods using healthy coping skills and then here also, if you're emphasizing cognitive interventions and conceptualization, you'd maybe be re redefining basic schemas like I must be perfect to be loved, you know, in order to increase a person's capacity for intimacy. So again, you want the goals to be as specific and concrete as possible because that's going to actually help guide the process. So in terms, of psycho, uh, in terms of cognitive behavioral, one of the most common interventions that will be used is psychoeducation. And this involves teaching clients you know, psychological principles, you, typically based on cognitive and behavioral theories, and using these principles to help handle the problems in their lives. And so there are three basic categories of psychoeducation. And again, this is used from the first session all the way through the process. But problem-oriented psychoeducation um, gives clients information about their diagnosis or situation. You know, it could be information about ADHD or schizophrenia, alcohol, alcohol dependence, depression. And they don't just use this as an information dump on their poor clients, but instead the goal here really is to motivate clients to take new action um, related to the issue. And so here it, it makes a difference whether or not a counselor is aware of the evidence base related to, you know, what types of treatments tend to work for ADHD. What do we know about the long-term outcomes of schizophrenia or alcohol dependence? What kind of treatments tend to work best? Those sorts of things. And so there is a real emphasis on educating clients about whatever their presenting problem is, about what type of treatments work, what's the general prognosis for the problem or situation, and again, what are some of the best options for working with these, uh, with the issue that the client brings. 
Another type of psychoeducation is more change-oriented, and so this is going to be information about how to reduce the problem symptoms, such as you know improving you know communication with partners or children, uh, reducing anger, managing depression, and so this type of psychoeducation uses you know the evidence base and theory practices and best practice strategies, not just the counselor's own personal experience, um, to, dis to talk with clients about options about how best or how possibly to manage their situation. The key here is always offering these types of, this type of psychoeducation when the client is ready and motivated to hear it. And um, I also think that breaking it down to small little bits and pieces, again, doing a long lecture on, you know, I don't know, three or four different ways to handle depression, probably isn't going to help most clients rather than, you know, identifying a couple of options and then discussing in detail how the client could integrate this option into their daily life and where they're struggling with depression or whatever the issue might be. So the change-oriented psychoeducation is giving clients really practical, useful information about what they could be doing differently. So the last type of uh, education kind of falls into the category of bibliotherapy or cinema therapy. And bibliotherapy is a very fancy term for assigning clients uh, readings, usually in popular psychology, to motivate them or to help them deal with their presenting problem. And so typically, as you might expect, the counselors would be assigning cognitive behavioral self-help books. Um, a real classic is things like Feeling Good or The Worry Cure, which reinforce what's going on in the counseling sessions. But you can also assign fictional or other types of literature that might be useful. Similarly, similarly, um, more and more uh, counselors look at cinema therapy, or you might even have an internet type of you know web page type of therapy in the sense of suggesting movies a client might watch to get some insight or motivation, and or websites that might be useful. You know, and I, I mean, I, there's also a caveat, you know, sending your clients to do an internet search on, um, for example, eating disorders will probably lead to some frightening <laughs> websites for um, some clients. So you really want to be careful and screen, actually, um, the internet. And I actually, some clients um, who tend to really get tripped up, I would say, by some of what they read on the internet, because none of it's actually screened you know, for accuracy. And so, you know, there are pro-cutting websites, there are pro-anorexia websites. And so you also need to be careful when you just send your client randomly to the internet to find information. I, I strongly recommend, you know, researching sites, making sure they're appropriate, and or just assigning a book um, too. So, but these are other ways that clients can basically educate themselves more to help them find useful solutions to their problems. Another type of intervention that's used um, coming out of the more cognitive tradition is using the uh, Socratic method and guided discovery. And this is where the counselor kind of open, asks open-ended questions to help clients discover for themselves that their beliefs are possibly illogical or don't make sense or just don't make sense for their particular situation. So this is where the counselor is not confronting directly, you know, a client's belief or saying, you know, that's illogical or that's, you know, unreasonable, but instead uses questions to more gently help clients come to that conclusion themselves. So, you know, some examples of what you can ask are what's the evidence that this automatic uh, thought is true or not true? Is there an alt possible alternative explanation for the situation? What's the worst that could happen? You know, could you live through that? What's the best that could happen? What's the most realistic, you know, outcome? Um, so, you know, just helping clients through questions, uh, encouraging them to question their own thoughts and beliefs to determine whether or not they're realistic um, and working for them in their lives. Another type of intervention are thought records. And these can be done both in session, and generally it's best to do a few of these in session before you send clients home. Um, but these teach clients how to better respond to automatic thoughts, and these are done in writing, and there's an example in the book. But it talks about um, identifying the trigger situation, you know, what was stressful, my, you know, my friend said something rude, and the automatic thought um, that the 
kind of gets triggered by this event and then identifying the resulting negative emotions and the percentage of that severity and then looking at an alternative adaptive response and then identifying also the alternative outcome in terms of the percentage of belief, intensity of emotion, and new action um, on the part of the client. So it could be, you know, my friend said something rude to me, and my automatic thought is I should never be treated that way, and I believe this 90%. Um, looking at the negative emotions and the percentage of severity that I, I get very angry, um, maybe a 70%, but I get angry and I withdraw from this friend and kind of looking at an alternative adaptive response might be to question, well, is what I, did I do something to trigger, possibly trigger this comment from my um, friend? Is the friend maybe having a bad day? Did something maybe happen to my friend in the past that might explain this? Is something else going on that I'm not even aware of? So kind of even, you know, just considering the possibility <laughs> that there's an alternative um, possibility for how to look at the situation can be very helpful in reducing the intensity of a person's emotion and helping them choose uh, more appropriate actions and responses. Similarly, um, the REBT uh, approach has a, a similar self-help form or approach to, you know, identifying the A, B, C, D, and E, and F, um, to help clients similarly, much like a thought record, kind of dispute their irrational thoughts. So identifying the A, activating event or consequence, the C, emotional behavioral, you know, consequences are usually pretty easy to identify. It's that B, belief, that's a little trickier. And then disputing the, that belief and identifying the effect in the new feeling by, um, by having this alternative belief. And so there's also a form that clients can use for that. Again, I would start using that in session first and then um, you know, assign it as, as homework. And I believe there's actually an online uh, form that clients can fill out to help them with this process. Another um, set of interventions is just simply labeling cognitions that are causing clients distress. So helping clients actually identify their distorted thinking patterns. And sometimes just having that label makes it more concrete, makes it easier to separate from that way of thinking. So things like arbitrary infer in inference, where you tend to jump to conclusions, se selective abstraction, where you're kind of filtering out positive things, over general generalization, um, another real common one, magnifying, minimizing um, are also common. Personalization, kind of exaggerating one's personal responsibility and or misinterpreting neutral comments or comments about someone else's somehow having reflection on you know yourself. Uh, dichotomous black and white thinking, uh, mislabeling, mind reading, it's a real favorite in relationships, and catastrophizing, always jumping to the worst possible, you know, outcome in most situations. So sometimes just giving it those labels helps, helps clients identify their problematic thoughts, their distressing thoughts, and become less invested in them. Another commonly, um, another common set of interventions used in Cognitive behavioral comes from Mike and Baum, and it's just problem-solving training. And it sounds so simplistic, but often uh, this can be very helpful to help clients actually identify the specific problem. Because oftentimes people come in overwhelmed by emotions, and they can't, they can hardly even sometimes accurately identify the problem. Identifying potential solutions. Selecting a particular solution and deciding, you know, to act on that, and then evaluating the, the effectiveness of the solution and or if something else needs to be done, whether or not it worked. And I know this sounds like painfully simple, um, but especially when people are dealing with very painful emotional problems, um, slowing them down, helping them actually solve the problem rather than getting stuck in it can be quite useful at times. Similarly, coping skills training by Ma uh, Mike and Baum kind of is a similar thing, but more general, identifying specific elements where the client could cope better more generally in life. So this is more like learning 
to deal with minor problems but regularly experienced problems. Identifying alternative coping strategies and choosing and applying these strategies and evaluating whether or not they're working. So again, um, uh, this type of training, it sounds kind of simpl simplistic, but breaking it down for people into simple steps and walking through people, walking clients through this can often be very helpful in terms of resolving issues that they bring to counseling and therapy. Another common intervention in CBT is stress inoculation training, which, which focuses on changing inner self-talk, and basically it helps uh, clients change their negative self-talk or inner dialogues so that generally it'll uh, target things like depression and anxiety. And basically this happens in three phases. It starts, um, no surprise, with a psychoeducation phase where you're providing information on negative self-talk and how it creates stress. And so many of us, uh, I've read some estimates like up to 90% of our inner dialogue is negative. And so this is kind of educating clients about how we very subtly, mo many of us are constantly uh, giving ourselves negative messages uh, about ourselves or the world and so there's psychoeducation about how we do this and then there's it goes into a period of training and practice rehearsing and practicing specific skills that apply to the client situation to reduce the negative self-talk and then the final phase is of course applying this in real world um, and practicing these skills in various areas of their life which might be work or relationship or related to body image or whatever it might be. Stress inoculation training often emphasizes positive self-talk, so helping clients prepare for a um, stressor, uh, using more positive self-talk and inner dialogue about that, and then uh, using positive self-talk around confronting and handling a stressor that, you know, oftentimes you know, a person when they get into a stressful situation, it's like, oh my god, this is terrible! And stress inoculation training will work on helping a person say, well, this is not what is preferred, but it's not as bad as things could be, that sort of thing. And then helping you know, the next day, next stage here is coping with the feeling of being overwhelmed and helping clients learn how to find ways that work for them. Everyone handles being overwhelmed in a very different way. So helping clients identify how they can better cope with their sense of being overwhelmed and then using reinforcing self-statements after stress, you know. I did it better than last time, um, that wasn't too bad, you know, I made some better decisions or, you know, whatever. So helping clients learn how to better manage their stress in stressful situations. And it, it is the sort of thing where, you know, each little small success tends to build upon um, the next and that over time uh, it can make a significant difference by simply trying to notice the stories we're telling ourselves when stressful situations come around and deciding to interact with that differently. Oftentimes a uh, stress inoculation can start with, you know, I can develop a plan to deal with stress. Um, so just getting people thinking even more positively about uh, preparing for the stressor then once they're confronting and having to manage a stressor, telling themselves, you know, take this one step at a, step at a time, I can handle this, you know, just focus on what you need to do. Then in terms of dealing with just the feeling of being overwhelmed, you know, focusing on the present, what is it that I have to do right now, um, instead of trying to just get rid of anxiety, trying to manage it. And like finally, like I said in the end, you know, focusing on you did it, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, you know, those sorts of things. And so the whole changing inner self-talk with stress inoculation is this process of, of increasing clients' awareness of how they're talking themselves and creating much of their own stress. Uh, another common intervention in CPT is cost-benefit analysis. And this is really basically comes down to developing a list of pros and cons. And although this may seem like obvious, um, or simplistic. Oftentimes when clients are feeling so overwhelmed and often in a very emotional, overly emotional state at times, um, sitting down and writing out the pros and cons of you know, if they got to make a big difficult decision can be quite helpful. Um, in fact, I once had a, a client, she must have been nine at the time,
time, but she was in foster care and she had some choices to make. And it was interesting because she, she, we had the pros, the positive and pros, cons, and she created a neutral column. And I've always liked that. So often I'll throw in the neutral elements, um, just in terms of uh, helping people make decisions. And so that is that idea of the zero column or the neutral column um, comes courtesy to you of one of my former clients. I've never seen it written about, but uh, I found it quite useful. Another form of intervention that gets used in the cognitive behavioral comes from the very classic tradition of um, classical conditioning, if you remember Pavlov's dogs, um, where you pair an unconditioned stimulus um, with a un, um, with a conditioned response and that if you remember in the classic Pavlov's dog situation that there was a bell that got paired with uh, salivation and so and in between that was the dog food so and so classic conditioning is a pretty specific technique uh, most commonly used uh, interventions based on this are most commonly used with phobias and certain types of anxieties but it, it can also be used in a more general way looking at uh, with clients who have some sleep difficulties in terms of often you know what they've how they've conditioned themselves in the sleep arena in terms of you know having a bedtime ritual and routine and such like that can also can be helpful um, with those sorts of issues but it's a very behavioral technique that has uh, specific applications that you know, there are times where this is is the most useful you know intervention to use, but it's very specific to certain conditions, most notably phobias and certain types of anxieties. Skinner and Pavlov just came up with this brilliant idea to have the dog versus cat interventions, behavioral interventions that were some of the earliest in behavioral approaches, um, but it's certainly uh, an easy way to remember it. So we have Pavlov and the dog salivating for their dog food, and if you own a dog, it's very easy to keep that image in mind. Um, the operant conditioning um, is, is related to Skinner and most notably his early experiments with cats, where basically um, what the, the Skinner boxes were doing were training, you know, training cats and mice and other animals to you know reinforcing them in the direction of desired change okay so small rewarding small incremental steps and so this is a process that's called shaping behavior and so often a reinforcement in terms of various times of positive and negative reinforcement and also punishment are most closely associated um, with the with operant conditioning and a lot of this is this type of research is used um, somewhat with parenting and other forms of behavior management and you might be you know familiar with some of these um, positive reinforcement or rewards so every time the client does demonstrate some behavior in the direction the desired direction there's some kind of reward given, something is given, uh, a treat. Um, alternatively, negative reinforcement is often a term that's mis misused in everyday language, but that means removing something negative when the, um, the person moves in the desired behavior. So that's like relaxing your uh, kid's curfew. Positive punishment refers to reducing undesirable behavior by adding something undesirable, so adding extra chores, whereas negative punishment is reducing undesirable behavior by removing something desirable. So that's like grounding, taking something away. So these types of reinforcements and punishments can help people, you know, learn new behaviors. And punishment operant conditioning, you will quickly come to learn that frequency and how behaviors are reinforced or punished makes a huge difference in the outcome. So generally the principle is immediacy, um, that the more immediate the reinforcement, the quicker the learning. And this is especially true with uh, younger children and of course the cats and bats and other animals that Skinner was working with. But let me tell you, if you can train a cat, you can do most train most anything. Um, Consistency uh, is also really key, and so the more consistent 
the reinforcement, the quicker the learning. And when you work with humans and their children, you will often find that consistency is the um, area where a lot of parents fall down because it is so hard in today's modern world to remain consistent because there's always there's so much going on and so that's why when working with parents around being consistent it's very important for them to set very realistic standards as well as you know realistic forms of reinforcement and punishment and I often um, tell the parents I work with that it is just more important to be consistent and you really just need to have small forms of reinforcement and punishment. They don't need to be big and lavish, but uh, consistency really is often the key with children because you develop a re reputation for meaning what you say, and that's the most important thing. So you don't have to have ugly, horrific punishments. You know, every time your child does, you know, doesn't do their homework or doesn't pick up or whatever it is you're reinforcing around, the issue is more just to be consistent about it and once you say something you follow through and that's really the key. Finally, uh, intermittent reinforce, reinforcement, especially random and unpredictable reinforcement, actually increases the likelihood of behavior for better or worse. And so basically, you know, Las Vegas is founded on this principle of intermittent reinforcement. If you think of slot machines, those are random and unpredictable reinforcement. Gambling falls into this. And because of that random intermittent uh, reinforcement, the person begins to believe that um, and get a sense of, well, you know, if I, you know, play the slots, whatever, one out of every four times I win or whatever it is. And so you begin to have this sense of how often uh, you win, how often you lose, and that keeps reinforcing that, you know, if I just play a few more times, you know, I should be winning, you know, because there's this intermittent schedule. And when it comes to parenting, what happens with intermittent reinforcement, if you know about half the time, you know, mom follows through on what she says and half the time she doesn't, you're much more willing to test those limits because, you know, half the time you're going to get what you want, you know, and so that's better than never getting what you want and always listening to her. So intermittent reinforcement, we see that in terms of often perpetuating negative behaviors. And so it's important to identify that pattern and seeing how we correct it. Alternatively, it's very interesting, um, some people suggest using intermittent reinforcement because it increases the likelihood of behavior, for better or worse, to actually intermittently reinforce children's positive behavior. So for example, if you have a kid who tends to, you know, get good grades or behave well to intermittently reinforce that um, with rewards or some, or relaxing of punish or relaxing of rules uh, that and clearly linking that to because you do you're so you know you take good care of your you focus on your grades and you're responsible at school or whatever the issue is um, you're going to get X and so linking those two together will actually work to. Um, increase those be desired behaviors. One of the most common places we see operant conditioning used is um, with young children, especially with these point charts or token economies. Um, this is typically used with children, but there are adaptations for adults. And so basically these point charts or token economies are used to shape and reward positive behaviors by building up points that can be applied to privileges or treats or purchases in a classroom setting, you know, for so many tickets you get pencils or erasers or whatever it is. Um, and this, these rewards should closely follow the desired behavior. And they should be frequent enough that the person feels motivated to do more. And the caveat here is that this is really, you, you can't raise a child using entirely point charts and token economies because they don't develop that inner sense um, this intrinsic motivation to do things, but there's always this constant bribe. So this needs to be used appropriately and sparingly and, and generally um, with new behaviors that a child is trying to master, but not once those behaviors should be developmentally sustained on their own. So this, after a while, especially when you get to teenage years, this ten, the older the kids get, I have found that the more this can backfire when the teen 
decides, well, it's not that important to me, all of a sudden the parent has no leverage in terms of working with the child. So these need to be used sparingly. Okay, I know the list seems to go on forever, but we got just uh, a few more here uh, interventions for CBT. Um, uh, but a classic one, again, this comes out of the behavioral tradition is systemic desensitization. It's used primarily with anxieties and specifically phobias, and it is based on classical conditioning. And that's basically where you start pairing the relaxation response um, with a stressful stimulus. And so you start with small amounts and slowly increase um, exposure. And so basically you begin by teaching relaxation uh, techniques, then creating a hierarchy of anxiety triggers. So having the client actually identify, you know, the least anxiety provoking thing than the next and up to the most, you know, anxiety provoking thing. So if there's a fear of spiders, you know, actually holding a spider would probably be at the top of the list and maybe at the bottom of the list is seeing a photograph of a spider or a drawing of a spider. And so working with the client, you know, up that hierarchy uh, to slowly expose them. But you get them into a relaxation state before exposing them to each one of these increasingly stressful stimuli. And so again, this is used a lot, quite a bit with uh, phobias and specific types of anxieties. So in the same vein, there are a couple other variations on uh, systematic desensitization that are, let's say, less gentle approaches. Uh, the first is in vivo exposure, which is a, exposing the person, you know, in real life to whatever the anxiety-provoking situation is and allowing the client to kind of work through their fears. And they stay in that anxiety-provoking situation until, the, until they become relaxed. So that could be, you know, um, if a person's afraid of heights, taking them up to you know, a high place where hopefully they should be physically safe. Um, obviously you should do this when you're well trained and having them work through that fear of heights at that level. Um, similarly, flooding is just uh, very similar to in vivo, but it is um, just an intense and prolonged exposure to the anxiety provoking stimulus, but it's, it can either be imagined or in vivo. So, and during this, the clients are not allowed to engage in their anxiety-reducing behaviors, um, and so allowing the fear to resolve itself more rapidly. And again, it's more appropriate for things like specific phobias or certain types of anxiety, like social anxiety, um, you know, rather than a general all-purpose intervention. Another intervention is EMDR, or Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Therapy. It's a very specific form of exposure therapy. It's a newer approach, and it's used primarily with trauma and stress. And it involves having clients imagine a traumatic or anxiety-provoking event while using uh, rapid eye movements to create bilateral stimulation of the brain. Now, there's quite a bit of controversy around this because of the fact that, you know, it's very different from many other approaches and not quite, you know, intuitive that why that would work. Um, nonetheless, it is recognized as an evidence-based uh, technique by the VA and is used quite a bit to treat trauma. And anecdotally, my clients who have worked with this, I mean, some find it very, very helpful and others don't, you know, find it helpful at all. And so I, my experience has been that people either really find it helpful or, or it doesn't seem to address their particular unique issues. Now, choice theory is a theory that was developed by William Glasser. And although it's not classically considered a cognitive behavioral, it is closely related in, in many ways, and especially in the form of intervention, although its theory is quite unique. And it focuses on the fact that the choices people make determine the quality of their lives. And Glasser identifies five basic needs that motivate these choices. One is belonging and relationships, the need to feel connected to people, um, the need for power and achievement, the need for fun, the need for having a sense of freedom and independence, and obviously the need for survival. And so when working with a person and trying to change uh, action um, is generally the easiest and most effective place to start, so starting with a behavior. So in this um, choice theory, which is part of reality theory, the behavioral analysis here begins with counselors helping 
to motivate clients to take responsibility for the, for the quality of their lives. And so they look at making choices to improve their situation using the um, WEP, which is wants exploring what a person really wants, needs, and what motivates them, doing, discussing what the clients are doing and the resulting direction from those choices of what they were doing, evaluating whether the effectiveness of these actions or choices are working, and then creating a plan of, for a course of action. So example, if you um, have a teen who is not uh, doing well in school, you would explore if they really do want to do better in school. What are they doing? Um, and what kind of results are they getting? You know, are those results what they want? And then coming up with a specific plan of action uh, to hopefully get better results, to get more of what they want. Um, another new wave in the cognitive behavioral world is our mindfulness-based approaches to therapy. And they're basically two major strands of therapeutic approaches that fall under the mindfulness-based approaches. The first are mindfulness-based therapies, and these are generally all in a group format, and their focus is really to teach mindfulness practices, and they're based primarily on a mindfulness-based stress reduction model, which we'll go into a little more detail on. Um, but they focus on teaching people mindfulness skills related to generally a specific topic, which might be stress or cognition for depression, um, there are eating disorder focused ones, substance abuse focused groups, and so, but a very specific, very structured group format where the primary intervention is to teach mindfulness practice. Mindfulness being a um, traditionally thought of as a meditation practice where you simply focus on the breath, but also referring to any practice that brings a person's attention into the present moment without judgment. Then there are mindfulness-based and mindfulness-informed therapies, and these are therapies that look more like traditional outpatient psychotherapy approaches, but they integrate mindfulness principles. So, they, and they may or may not even teach mindfulness directly, and so ACT or um, dialectical behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy is what ACT stands for. These are two of the major uh, mindfulness-based approaches to counseling and psychotherapy. It is. It simply refers to present moment awareness without any judgment or without intention. So focusing on what's going on in the present moment, generally focusing on a single stimuli such as the breath or physical sensations in the body, or and it could also be external stimuli such as um, eating a, a food mindfully or walking mindfully or even washing dishes mindfully but bringing your attention fully into the present moment, quieting the inner dialogue, and experiencing what's going on without judgment. And so mindfulness practices generally take the form of um, sitting and focusing on your breath. There are also compassion, closely related compassion meditations that are used uh, extensively with couples and families. And then also the everyday practices like walking, eating, washing the dishes. And there really is an impressive evidence base um, that mindfulness practice has a wide, affects a wide range of both physical and mental health disorders. And that it can actually help change brain physiology so that a person actually has a happier disposition. And a lot of the reason they think it helps so many disorders is that it seems to be particularly effective in shutting down the stress response. And if you can just imagine, if you shut down the stress response, there are a lot of physical illnesses that are, of course, exacerbated, if not brought on by stress, as well as um, most psychological disorders are certainly not helped and certainly improve when a person is less stressed. So the more a person can learn to manage their stress response and actually consciously invoke their relaxation response using mindfulness, generally their symptoms get better. So there are some basic mindfulness principles um, that have been particularly transformative to cognitive behavioral practices. And the first is acceptance. And there's this paradox in terms of accepting the unwanted symptom. And so there's because traditionally in the cognitive behavioral approach, you identify the problem, the symptom, and you eradicate it, pretty much, is how it's been focused. Whereas mindfulness kind of turns all that on their head, and it's like, you know, 
start by accepting what is, being with what is. So accepting and being with difficult thoughts and emotions in order to transform them. And this at first sounds paradoxical, but if you actually try it a few times, just sitting with and accepting and fully being in the moment with your negative feelings of sadness or depression or anxiety almost always transforms them in some way that makes it easier to engage them. There's also this uh, con concept of compassion, which is curiously and compassionately observing difficult thoughts and feelings without the intention to change them. And so being able to accept that you feel angry at times, you feel disappointed at times, you feel jealous at times, you feel sad at times, you feel unenthused at times, whatever it is. But learning to experience that without having secondary judgment, oh my God, this is absolutely terrible, this should never happen, oh my God, i got to fix this, just being with it often dramatically changes its course. And then finally, the, the big thing that comes through um, mindfulness practice is changing how a person relates to their thoughts. And this is particularly, we're, we're finding particularly uh, important when, when working with depressed people or anxious people because changing how you relate to your thoughts is particularly helpful in preventing depression relapse um, and or anxiety relapse because you're able to develop a different type of relationship to your thoughts where you're like, yep, I'm having, or your thoughts or your moods, I'm having a, you know, a down period right now. I'm starting, you know, being able to observe your thoughts and not only thinking depressive thoughts, but becoming aware that you are thinking depressive thoughts all of a sudden gives you a different um, way to engage with those. And often people will choose a, a better way out than when they feel totally fused with their thoughts and emotions. And because I'm having this emotion, I am this emotion, it takes over all of who I am. Rather than getting a little bit of distance between your, your thoughts and your emotions and being able to observe them as a pretty neutral outside observer as if that's possible. But developing this observer perspective to your thoughts and feelings begins to create some space in terms of how a person chooses to respond to those. So behavior therapy is one of the um, oldest and best well-known mindfulness-informed therapies and it focus in its primarily was developed to work with borderline personality, a traditionally very difficult to treat um, um, disorder and dialectical behavior therapy is one of the only evidence-based treatments for that approach and basically it focuses on the dialectical tension um, between changing what's going on in our life and accepting it and so it focuses a lot on these dialectical tensions that we have and uses mindfulness as one of the one of several um, main types of interventions for managing our inner complex inner world and especially when working with people with borderline personality, this helps them to better tolerate and accept the strong emotions and, and that, through that process learn how to transform them and create great, a greater balance in their lives. So in terms of the research and evidence base for cognitive behavioral therapy, it is one of the best research approaches um, and has a strong empirical support for treating a range of specific disorders. And that said, it is part of the cognitive behavioral tradition to do research, and that is kind of the, the much of this is kind of even built into how they think and how they work the entire model. That said, there is there is there's a, a counter critique of the evidence that most research that actually has neutral investigators. So these are people who are not studying their own theory, who are not invested in their own theory. That most approaches actually have you know similar outcome effects for disorders such as depression or most forms of anxiety, generalized anxiety, that sort of thing. So, but certainly cognitive behavioral therapy has a very strong evidence base and it is widely used for a range of disorders. In terms of working with diverse populations, 
it's just important when you're working um, using cognitive behavioral therapy because there is this tendency to identify your rational thoughts um, it's important to be to spend some time understanding a client's cultural background or other diversity related um, views so that issues related to diversities are not erroneously um, pathologized because what what is rational is very much dependent on a person's culture from which they come and each culture develops its own set of you know acceptable appropriate behaviors and a sense of what is right and wrong a sense of what what is common knowledge common logic those sorts of things are very much culturally based and culture by culture I mean not just ethnicity but also social economic class how what's what's a logical way to you know handle problems at very various levels of social economic class it varies tremendously and so it's important that when you're working with a diverse clients that you are very a little bit especially a client that might be from a different background than your own to be especially careful when trying to identify an irrational belief um, because often that is very much culturally defined. So I hope you have enjoyed this um, lecture on cognitive behavioral. I know it was a bit long, um, but hopefully it also gets you started with one of the most widely used counseling and psychotherapeutic uh, therapies out there.